Welcome to The Late Show. It is the 3rd of May, Wednesday the 3rd of May. And did I say May? I meant to say April. But it's not the 1st of April and it is the 3rd of May. Thank you very much for... Uh, it's very difficult when you don't have a script, you can say things wrong right at the beginning of a programme. I was, I was thinking today, after seeing in today's daily times, this cartoon, the, car the Times cartoon, there may be an even better one on there. This is uh, relating to Hamza Useless's um, Hate Crime Act. There's nothing new under the sun, by the way, but if you remember, the police used to say, you have a right to remain silent, and anything that you say may be used in evidence against you. But this uh, Hate Crime Act has been accurately uh, described in this cartoon you do not have the right to say anything. Now, it would be funny if it wasn't absolutely serious and, and true. And let's see how we go as we look back through history and see how we've got to where we are today. And I'd suggest it has got something to do with, and I know you've heard it before on Revelation TV, it has got something to do with the new world order and one world government. And I, I want to just draw uh, uh, on some historic speeches. Uh, who started this ball rolling? Well, it, there's nothing new under the sun. You know, it goes right back to, you could say, Napoleon tried to start a new world order with him as the top dog. You could say Nebuchadnezzar did. You could say Hitler did. He certainly did try. It's, it's this sort of urge for world hegemony. And of course, the United States with Woodrow Wilson, uh, just over 100 years ago, with his 14-point plan, he was calling basically for one world government, which led to the League of Nations, but Congress wouldn't vote for it, so um, the Americans didn't join the League of Nations, which eventually became the um, United Nations Organization. And I want to just uh, quote first this speech uh, from George Bush Sr. It was in 1991, if I remember rightly, uh, he was the 41st president. He wasn't George W, he was George H. W. Uh, Bush. But he gave a speech after the uh, fall of the Berlin War. Until now, the world we've known has been a world divided, a world of barbed wire and concrete block conflict in the Cold War. Now we can see a new world coming into view, a world in which there is a genuine prospect of new world order. In the words of Winston Churchill, a world order in which the principles of justice and fair play protect the weak against the strong. Okay, a world where the United Nations, freed from Cold War stalemate, is poised to fulfill the historic vision of its founders, a world in which freedom and respect for human rights find a home among all nations. And a world organization has already been erected for the prime purpose of preventing war, the UNO, the United Nations Organization, the successor of the League of Nations, with the decisive addition of the United States and all that that means is already at work. Oh, I'm so sorry we went into the Winston Churchill, which is not what I wanted, but doesn't matter. I wanted to just come out just to uh, pause and reflect on George Bush uh, talking about the, um, uh, uh, the hopes uh, for peace uh, following the breakup of the Soviet Union. But he quoted Winston Churchill, and that's why our second slate was uh, Winston Churchill. It, it was in Fulton, Missouri, at a place called Westminster College, where uh, he gave his famous Iron Curtain speech, where he said, a new Iron Curtain has, has, has descended over Europe from Stettin in the north to, can't remember where it was in the south, uh, and that was in 1946. But that is a really important speech. I'm a bit of a nerd, but I, I say it's an important speech because he said quite a lot. And of course, as people do with the Bible, they sometimes pick out the juicy bits from a speech and everyone remembers it as the Iron Curtain speech. But it was the sinews of freedom or however he described it. But within that speech, Winston Churchill talked about this new world order, but he said this. Uh, let's read this first. A world organization has already been erected for the prime purpose of preventing war. The United Nations Organization, the successor of the League of Nations, 
with the decisive addition of the United States and all that that means, it's already at work. Now, Winston Churchill, sorry, go straight on. I can't do any commentary in between the slates, so let's do that. And he carried on and said this, we must make sure that its work is fruitful, uh, that it is a reality and not a sham, that it is a force for action and not merely a frothing of words, that it is a true temple of peace in which the shields of many nations can someday be hung up and not merely a cockpit in a tower of Babel. Those are not my words. Those are the words of Winston Spencer Churchill. Uh, basically saying, look, the United Nations could be valuable. It could be a force for good. Uh, we've shown before this um, statue of the beating of swords into plowshares. It, it sounds wonderful, but the danger, as we all know, with such large institutions is they become a gravy train for, you know, world diplomats uh, to feed on in the trough. And you see them often turning up on, uh, you know, commentary and news programs around the world. And they all look very, very well fed as they're talking about how, how there's so much poverty in the world. But aside from that, it has sadly in the words of Winston Churchill, become a cockpit on this globe, um, a cockpit of the Tower of Babel. And I'd like to use that as our uh, 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 hinge on which we uh, talk about this programme. But that if we want to just watch, look at one more of these quotes, uh, this is also from Winston Churchill in The Sinews of Speech, of uh, Peace Speech. Before we cast away the solid assurances of national armaments for self-preservation, we must be certain that our temple is built not upon a shine, shifting sands or quagmires, but upon the rock. Anyone can see with his eyes open that our path will be difficult and also long, but if we persevere together, as we did in the two world wars, though not alas in the interval between them, I cannot doubt that we shall achieve our common purpose in the end. Okay, so Churchill was a good guy. He's one of the good guys. Uh, he had an aspiration. Uh, people called him a warmonger, but he gave great speeches for uh, peace. Uh, but of course, uh, those who follow on, you know, as we know, even in church denominations, sometimes those who follow the founders don't always, you know, follow as, as well as uh, the founders. And, um, so George Bush Sr., he jumps on this bandwagon. He quotes Winston Churchill. But, you know, I could, I could name half a dozen UN organisations which were far, um, far less than the ideal of peacemaking. And in fact, in the case of UNRWA, it's been complicit in uh, the, the warmongering of, of Hamas, has to be said. I mean, countries around the world are withdrawing funding from UNRWA. In fact, the tragedy that we had uh, yesterday uh, with uh, these aid agents, uh, agencies and British, three British Marines uh, dying in that strike is largely down to the loss of confidence in the UN and in UNRWA that's led to these independent aid agencies uh, going in to try and bring help, uh, humanitarian help to the Palestinian people. So you can email in live at revelationtv.com or on the text number and tell me your thoughts about the success or otherwise of the new world order. I, I want to drill into a few news headlines just to show how menacing a world order can become. But before I do that, I want to first uh, uh, talk about the original Tower of Babel, which is there in Genesis chapter 11 and we're going to read the scriptures uh, and see if you can see any hints of what we have today in this first building of the tower of babel it'll come up on the screen now now the whole world had one language and a common speech as people moved eastward they found a plain in shinar and settled there they said to each other come let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly they used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Of course, because they're 
creating this Tower of Babel. They've got to use their own man-made materials. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Reading on if we can. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down. Elohim, let us, plural, go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. And of course, they were um, scattered. So the one thing they feared came about. Yeah, th this one world language business, you can see it you know, within sight uh, with AI and, and with translation. By the way, you don't even need AI to see that around the world, let's say following COVID, every world puppet world leader, I'd call them, stood up and said, let's build back better. Let's build back better. We build back better. We're going to build back better. Um, they were all following the same script. It was almost as though they had one language. And it, it's some, because we have this worldwide media, it looks ridiculous. And, and you see on social media as well, everyone puppeting and, and rabbiting the same, the same commitments. Well, I want to have a little... Uh, look further at uh, some of these details. Now I showed you this, this because this happened in Scotland over the last few days and um, JK Rowling has basically put her head above the parapet and said arrest me. She um, is challenging the hate crime law we've seen in the newspapers over the last few days and the police have had to come out in today's newspaper and say, no, 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 we're not going to arrest her. It's not the hate crime. So, you know, how ridiculous. And by the way, it isn't the first time that the Scottish government have had to row back or wind back a, a stupid law that they've passed. You may remember the named person scheme with Nicholas Sturgeon and um, Winnie, what was his name, Swinney, um, uh, they're coming out with this genius scheme which replaced parents with state-appointed guardians who are often teachers, but every child should have the protection of the state, so much so that we will usurp or, or overthrow the authority and responsibility of parents and the state will have a state guardian. Well, that was successfully challenged by the Christian Institute and... Um, they had to step back, but they haven't learnt. They haven't learnt the SNP government in Scotland because they've now come up with this this hate crime bill. Now, <clears throat> also, they're not the first ones to come up with such a hate crime bill. And I want to show you uh, before I read some of your emails. I want to show you a brilliant um, part extract of an interview that Simon. Uh, Barrett uh, did with, with Reagan on Behind the Headlines a few weeks ago of, of Joe Boots. Um, Joe Boots, a great modern day, you know, Francis Schaeffer, uh, Christian philosopher who can see, you know, and after you listen to him, we can all see it, the, the dangers of state power and uh, you could also say world power that seems to be being replicated is not only in China. This is uh, Joe Boot talking about the hate crime bill in Canada. Uh, Joe, it's a pleasure to have you on uh, buying headlines, particularly as you can give us real insight into what is happening in Canada. Would you say with this new legislation known as BC63, the online um, harms bill, um, it will actually be used to weaponize a free speech and just share with us the full authoritarian nature of this legislation. And would you say this was the worst legislation in terms of freedom that we've seen in any Western country throughout the entire world? Yes, um, Bill C-63, uh, the Online Harms Act that you're referring to, I think is probably the most frightening um, piece of legislation that we've seen tabled, not, not just in Canada, but probably anywhere 
um, in the Western world in recent years. You have to remember that the, the, the various bills that have actually been tabled in Canada over the last 18 months or so, you can see them being constructed so that they actually work together um, to effectively stamp out um, uh, freedom of expression. And it's obvious who the real targets of this legislation actually is. So very quickly, first of all, we had Bill C-4, and that was the conversion therapy ban, uh, the definition of which you could drive a bus through. Almost anything could be defined as conversion therapy, even, even the desire to lessen somebody's desire um, uh, in terms of gender dysphoria or same-sex desire um, was being deemed uh, and is deemed now in Canada criminal. If, a, if an adult, a consenting adult, were to come to you as a Christian pastor in Canada and ask for counsel uh, because they've got unwanted same-sex desires and you said, yes, sure, come to my office, you know, next five Wednesdays, um, and uh, that was uh, taken to the courts and you were prosecuted, you'd go to jail for five years as a pastor, just helping a consenting adult. Bill C-63, what this particular bill seeks to do is introduce a new legislation into the criminal code uh, regarding the promotion of hatred. It's done in the name of protecting children. It actually introduces a life sentence for somebody promoting um, genocide online. Um, now, all of us here would not be for the promotion of genocide. Um, uh, but the difficulty, of course, is that the definition of what is uh, genocide or genocidal, for example, a lot of people talk about what is happening in Israel and Gaza right now as uh, a genocide um, against Palestinians. Well, uh, could that be captured if you are actually are, uh, not for the pro-Palestinian cause? It also adds a five year prison sentence um, for uh, the uh, basically promotion of anything that's deemed to be hatred. So this is Section 319 of the Criminal Code uh, that's being amended here uh, in Bill C-63. And it's threatening, yeah, five years for promoting hate, life imprisonment for pr uh, promoting genocide. And of course, what happens when this kind of legislation gets introduced is more and more people want their particular views protected by mm. the legislation. When you see that bill alongside Bill C-367, which was introduced last November, this is a bill to repeal the protections for um, uh, those who have a genuine religious belief, a genuine theological conviction, let's say, about human identity and sexuality. The, the, um, the criminal code originally protected religious speech about those issues, that that couldn't be deemed a public incitement to hatred. Uh, this bill, which was introduced in November, um, uh, which has gone a bit quiet at the moment, um, but no doubt it will be um, pushed through in due course, at least that or a version of it, I have no doubt, it'll probably be renumbered and renamed, uh, is an attempt to remove any protection for religious speech as um, inciting hatred. So you can see that Bill 60, C63 and C63 uh, 367 working together would basically criminalize Christian doctrine, Christian speech, um, not just Christian pastoral care now, uh, which is already criminalized under Bill C4 for people struggling with their identity and their sexuality. So this is a truly terrifying piece of legislation. It's a terrifying legislative framework that's being set up. And the goal is to shut people up. There you go. Is exactly what uh, uh, Joe said is, is on that cartoon in the Times. You know, you do not have the right to speak up. You do not have the right to say anything. Now, uh, that C63 online, you know, hate speech act also has within it something, and it may have been in Simon's program. By the way, Simon's behind the headlines with... Um, with uh, Reagan can be found on demand. It's the 20th of March edition, a couple of weeks ago. And, and also I should say that I interviewed uh, uh, Joe Boot last year. He's written an excellent book called The Mission of God. And that can also uh, be found on demand uh, on the Revelation TV website. But as I say, 
there was more to this bill, as there always is. And sometimes you think, oh, it was such a good thing to prevent online harm to children. Uh, and this is a headline from the Wall Street Journal, because we've tried to cater for the, our American audience. And I'll read it carefully so that we can get what they're saying. Online Harms Act, crime and punishment, not in that order. Now, the point about it is that within this act, there has a provision to arrest people before they commit a crime. So the system, this comes back to my overarching theme, the system of this cockpit of the Tower of Babel is actually assessing through AI whether someone is about to commit a crime. Can you see the scope for that? Given what Joe Boot says about how they are deliberately targeting Christian pastors, um, those who they'll call neoconservatives or those fundamentalist Christians who believe in the inerrancy of the Bible, you know, they're the really dangerous ones for this new world order. So we'll target them. But this, um, I, I'm putting up, by the way, these news headlines just so that you don't think I'm making it up. This is in the Wall Street Journal. They are threatening to prosecute people for pre-crimes. Now, you, you might remember the minority report. I, I couldn't get my head around it when, when it was a Tom Cruise film, um, which, you know, where he's a law enforcement officer and basically he is, um, you know, finding through this amazing supercomputer, it all seemed to be completely science fiction, um, uh, who was about to commit crime and he would, you know, jump into his car, drive around the corner, you know, and ar arrest someone, you know, just before they got the knife out of the kitchen cupboard and, and they were, you know, had handcuffed. Um, and um, without distracting too much, uh, we can see a world in focus. And by the way, you think, oh, what's the relevance of all of this, Tim? But it is relevant because in many ways the Bible uh, also uh, has a kind of pre-crime uh, built into the prophecies. And, and Howard, uh, in this amazing intro to World in Focus, is showing how the scriptures have predicted what is going to come on the world. He's predicted, uh, uh, the Lord has predicted the motives of mankind. He's predicted, you know, through the writings of Peter, the apostle, and and also uh, the writings of Paul, um, very clearly in the last days this will happen. And in the last days, and you know, Howard will be uh, quoting scriptures there, uh, and um, this is a kind of, you know, hybrid world in focus and late show. But if we come back, I just wanted to show you another uh, scripture, uh, which, or two, and then we'll, I promise you we're going to get through to your emails. Thank you very much for writing them in. I've got emails up to 2018, so you may still be writing some and I'll read them out. There's a couple more scriptures which show how the Bible has predicted what will come. For the time will come, 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 to 4. The time will come when men or people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Well, that is just the modern entertainment industry, isn't it? Uh, they will turn their ears away, by the way, which is in the church as well. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Isn't that sad? And then also in uh, Peter, he warns. He warns about what will happen in the last days. Scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. Uh, they will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. Apart from the word creation, that would be the, the line used by the so-called new atheists, the militant atheists. Oh, you know, what is all this nonsense about, about you know, creation, about God's return, the Lord Jesus' return. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. That's in 2 Peter 3, verse 3 to 5. And the point about it is that um, there's plenty of evidence. They forget what happened long ago. They are willfully blind to the evidence 
of dramatic events happening in the geology and you know we're just laughed at and scoffed at but the good thing is we're not sitting in the seat of the scoffers and our delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law we meditate day and night. Thank you very much for your emails so far. I'm going to read some of them and then we'll go back to our, our theme. Um, first one is coming in. People are, aren't allowed to speak about same-sex marriage, uh, John writes, as it isn't a normal. I would probably get a police caution for saying this. Well, I might also, also, John. Uh, by the way, I'm going to just read something that Dory sent me. Dory, you might, you might be watching, you might be um, uh, writing in on this subject, but uh, Dory's sent um, some information on how much money Stonewall, the great campaigning group, have received from taxpayers' money. And it does fit in with our theme because um, around the world, taxpayers' money is being fed into this one world government progressive liberal machine. It's a kind of fifth column, by the way, which Churchill also warned about in his uh, uh, Fulton, Missouri speech. Fifth column communists, as it were, who've infiltrated our country, uh, who are taking taxpayers' money. And, um, this controversial charity has received over £500,000 directly from government grants and another 500000 through its Diversity Champions programme. And by the way, this isn't just a wacky right-wing Christian uh, TV station talking about this. This came from, a uh, warning came from the Equalities, Women and Equalities Minister, none other than the Business Secretary, Kemi Bag Badenoch, and she recognised the significant harm and damage caused by the government's funding of Stonewall and was, has repeatedly made it clear that government departments should withdraw from the charity's diversity scheme. And by the way, it's not just governments. Um, they have infiltrated the Church of England. Church of England uh, produced their valuing all God's children, trans-affirming guidelines. I know, I, I've almost fell off my chair when I saw the introduction by the Archbishop saying that, you know, why shouldn't you know, children cross-dress in, in Church of England primary schools. It also was um, uh, taken up by high street banks. They in, enrolled in Stonewall's diversity programme and it all fits in with this environmental and social governance uh, movements, which uh, has led to a lot of the uh, banking and they closed the account of uh, Reverend, Reverend Rich and Richard Fothergill, who founded a uh, filling station. By the way, that's another face-to-face um, -face with Laura Brett on the filling station after he politely expressed his disagreement over their promotion of transgender ideology. He's a very polite and decent, decent man. And of course, in the media, the BBC um, has been, as it were, infiltrated uh, by this uh, movement and, you know, many people have lost their jobs. Uh, thank you, Dory, for sending that through. There is a petition that can be signed um, on uh, Citizen Go, so you can find that if you want to now, if you want to sign up, which, by the way, I have done. Ian writes, I attended the protest along with just uh, over four or 500 other people outside of the Scottish Parliament on Monday. Also, I did strongly sense that we shall very soon see civil unrest on the streets across Scotland. This is because of this, you know, hate crime bill. Furthermore, this Sunday, Rangers play Celtic. So how hate crime bill will affect this, God only knows. Also, Rangers are known for a strong pro-Israel stance and Protestant stance. As for Celtic, they are very pro-Palestine and Roman Catholic. Finally, I did, I, I, I strongly believe, um, get a word from the Lord about civil war in the UK by the end of April 2025. I believe now Scotland shall kick this off with mass unrest to finish Hamas useless. Oh yeah, I haven't, I haven't put it that way. I've always said Hamas are useless, but you now call him Hamas useless. Um, has had graffiti and people outside his home brewing to get hands on him and he needs strong protection. Loyalists and also some Muslims are after him. Let us hope he either comes to know Christ or is removed by being forced out as soon as possible. But I don't believe wither shall happen. That's from Ian. Thank you very much for that, Ian. Um, there's an empty text that's just come through. Um, Debbie writes, on your own, Tim, 
What about this woman? Her 10 points to destroy Christianity, one of which was to make homosexuality acceptable. A lot of these points in these dark days seem to have happened. I am not aware of that, Debbie. Someone may be able to write in and clarify. I do, I do remember the, um, the gay, what they call it, the, the Gay Liberation Manifesto. One of, this is in the 1960s, one of whose policies in their manifesto was to destroy the family, the seat of their oppression. Okay, this is uh, an anonymous text. It just says, the tower they were building uh, as something, it didn't invite God, and God is a jealous God. That is true. It was basically saying we can do it on our own. We can build up to the heavens. By the way, you've never seen so many skyscrapers as we have in, in our day. And I have n I'll never forget when there was a debate at the end of the 19... 90s about the building of the Millennium Dome. Um, David Meller said, uh, defending it, I've forgotten on some commentary program, said, but it's a celebration of the ascent of man. And I thought, really? Okay, it's just a big tent. Um, Ian writes again, he says, on Saturday at 1.30, we're having a protest against the World Health Organization in, in Glasgow. Uh, and the people who are behind it, the World Economic Forum, hate crime bill, it all goes and works together. Finally, Khan in London, Sunak, Useless, Sawa, who is leader of Labour in Scotland. Also, history shows Scots do not take well to be dictated to. Uh, police Scotland are also saying they would struggle to police this hate crime bill. Murdo Fraser, Christian MSP of Scottish Conservative Party, is now subject to him being investigated for wanting to abolish this act and also the Transgender Act. Also, the Conservatives in Scotland are against it. And um, uh, I am a party of Scottish, I'm part of the Scottish Family Party who at most pro uh, protests against free speech, abortion, LGBT ideology too. Please get Scottish Family Party onto Revelation TV. Well, um, this isn't the politics show, <laughs> but I think it is, it is a show that's warning, I think from the scriptures, that things are going in a certain direction. And it's not, I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I do read speeches and I read trends and I read the newspapers. And when, when you have, you know, popular authors, and by the way, who, whose books I don't support or read, are uh, coming out you know, and saying, look, what about women's rights and women's identity and, you know, um, just a, a fair um, level playing field for women in sports, uh, they're being accused of hate speech and they're shouted, shouted down. On the 8th of April, Les writes, there is a total eclipse of the sun over America. Do you think it has any significance from a biblical perspective? So the first thing I'd say, Les, is that this isn't Q&A. <laughs> so write that one back into Q&A, but I'll read the rest of what you said. It will be seven years since the previous one over America in 2017. Jesus mentioned signs in the sun, moon and stars in Matthew 24. Apparently the eclipse starts in Texas and is set to cross over seven cities called Nineveh. What if it meant that America has 40 days to repent as biblical Nineveh did? Is it a prophetic warning? I, as a general rule, I think we should take any, any warnings, uh, uh, prophetic warnings, even if they are from modern biblical commentators that call for a nation to return to the Lord. Uh, what, if people are, are giving a biblical warning of, of a disaster, I think we have to measure that against the scriptures and the overarching um, warnings of, of judgment and rewards that we have in the scriptures. Let's um, read a little more. This is from Paul and Ruth. Thank you, by the way, for keeping me alive during the late show, because otherwise you just have to listen to me, which, is, which isn't as interesting as reading your emails. From Paul and Ruth, all scripture seems to point to one thing. It seems that the four horses of the apocalypse is heading towards one final destination, towards Israel and the Christians of the world. God is running ahead to halt the horses that are, it seems, assembling themselves in that place which will be called Armageddon. Um, if I could make a comment, um, Paul and Ruth. I was once on, a, on a, one of our 
tours to Israel. And you know, every now and again, the, the guide who travels with us on, on the coaches drops me in it and hands me the Bible and says, Tim, read this. So I happen to be up on Megiddo, that amazing tell, uh, which has layers, multiple layers of, of cities through the generations. And he handed me uh, the passage from Revelation 16. And now Tim is going to read this, uh, where it says, and they gathered together at the place called Armageddon. It's the same place. It's where Napoleon said, this is where I'd like to fight my great last battle. And he wasn't the first or the last. But I, I felt when I looked at all of those um, great kingdoms and empires that have built their grand you know, platform, an amazing uh, site that's, that has its own secret water source, an ancient city as old as Jericho. And I felt to say this, and it is relevant to our uh, talk tonight, um, Paul and Ruth, because all the world's peacemaking efforts have led to war. And all the uh, efforts of the United Nations peacemakers often end, sadly, despite what Churchill said, they end in war. And the reason that those peacemaker, peacemaking efforts fail is because they don't take account of the Prince of Peace. They don't take account of um, the scriptures uh, themselves that they quote in Isaiah 2, where it says, the word of the Lord goes forth, will go forth, from Zion. The law will go forth from Jerusalem. They don't take account of God's law. And you can't have peace within a chaotic framework of man-made laws and man-made towers of Babel and you know, man-made you know, governments, you know, the laws of the Medes and the Persians that cannot be annulled, which you know, were set out there by Darius and then had to be you know, overturned because they were stupid. And that is the problem with the laws of our, our day. Um, Debbie just says, Yemi is aware of this woman as he has mentioned her many times. Okay, thanks Debbie. Uh, this is uh, from uh, Marcus, I think. Um, how about this one? Sad Ik Khan. Sad Ik Khan, get it? No, I don't get it. <laughs> you might need to explain that riddle a bit better. The 10 points plan, Dory says, is to destroy society. It was drawn up by occultist Alice Bailey and taken up by the UN. Yemi knows the details. Thank you, Debbie and Dory, for correcting me. And even Mary says, this was Alice Bailey, occultist and one of the founders of the New Age movement. I do remember that, actually. I, I do remember reading Dave Hunt many years ago, warning about this. Uh, this is um, also from uh, Ian... It's quite long, Ian, so I might read that if, um, if we have time at the end. Uh, this is from Eddie, Eddie the Atheist. I wonder if Hamza Yusuf would defend my rights to draw a cartoon of the prophets. Eddie, you just try. I honestly um, do not believe that anyone in today's progressive, liberal, uh, tolerant world would, would tolerate anything that's that goes against the Prophet Muhammad. And it's been proved, by the way, even uh, teachers innocently, uh, harmlessly wanting to talk about the history of what's happened in our lifetime. You think of Pim uh, Fontaine in, in Holland, you think of, of um, uh, Charlie Hebdo, and you know, some of the other cases that there is a, a in this age of toleration, there's an incredible ill intolerance. And, and by the way, uh, Churchill in his speech talked about defending Christian civilization. It wasn't for the first time he mentioned it. And the reason is that Christ, a Judeo-Christian worldview is very tolerant. It, it's no accident that the, uh, you know, the British emperor, until they reneged on their promises to Israel, was very successfully built on a Judeo-Christian moral and ethical framework. So, um, you know, to trash that, as, as many uh, left-wing, you know, fifth columnists are doing, um, is a tragedy. They've dismantled our 
the Christian uh, framework of, of tolerance and as a nation we're ruining the day. The, the church has even adopted, adopted this kind of ESG approach to church life and, and created the new religion, uh, frankly, which is, you know, build, build a whole load of, uh, of solar panels over the grass so that, you know, and the field so that you can capture the sun <laughs> and destroy the basic provision of food which comes from the sun. <laughs> and you think, oh, well, it's much more efficient to get this sort of um, battery power from the sun uh, when, when we're losing just the, the basic uh, commodities of life. It's so con self-contradictory, but it is an absolute fanatical religion. And we're supposed to be the fanatics. Uh, and non-Christian charities don't like me speaking about Jesus. Um, sadly, it, it's, it's become, you know, much, much more common I remember when uh, uh, the co-op uh, pulled the bank account from uh, Stephen Green, I think it was, in Christian Voice, and then we discovered that the they used to, the, the chap who headed it up was was on crystal meths, and you know the whole thing was corrupt, and he had to resign. Uh, and then we had learnt from uh, actually I I've known a number of ministries that have been. Uh, have had to struggle against this debanking long before uh, Nigel Farage was debanked by Coots and NatWest Bank. Uh, dear Tim, this is from David. Uh, thank you for your ministry, honesty and faithful. But the Apostle Peter said to honour all men and we should not misuse names of others, especially those in leadership, political and religious, Scottish First Minister, etc. Uh, a danger of too much humour, impersonating people. I, I failed in this area in the past. You are gifted and courageous for God, along with many other, many in Christian media. Uh, Catherine Kuhlman once gently warned David Wilkerson to be more uh, cautious of how we speak of dignitaries. Yeah, I, sometimes I use humour to illustrate the point. Uh, and, and by the way, it wasn't, I hadn't, I'm not the one who originated the, the comments uh, or, or, or others who, who, who have, I've read out about Hamza Youssef. I think it was on G, GB News. And uh, that was because he, before he was elected, after they hounded Kate Forbes out of, out of the leadership race uh, to be first minister, because of her Christian views, by the way, and they installed... Uh, the practicing Muslim, Hamza, Hamza Yusuf, they, they, all the media were saying that he had failed in his previous uh, job. So why is this man put in as the first minister? That is me commenting on, you know, the general commentary. Okay, oh Tim, come on, IQ as in intelligence, sad IQ Khan. Okay, got it. You're getting me into trouble now, Marcus, because I've, I've just had to explain myself. Right. Okay. Yeah, I rattled through, I rattled through these, these early, early quotes, but I think it's in, important to say, look, Churchill used the term, which I've given the title of this late show. He used the term, a cockpit in a tower of a Babel. Um, just a little comment on humour, because Churchill was filled with humour. Uh, just think of Elijah when he confronted the prophets of Baal. You know, in one sense, uh, to push the points home, you could say, well, the prophets of Baal were very eminent in the court of, of, of Jezebel, and how, how dare Elijah say something against them. Uh, and... The Bible does say, and you're, you're quite right uh, to challenge me, um, not to be too flippant with those who are, are uh, in leadership. And even David said of, of the wicked king Saul, touch not the Lord's anointed. But there comes a time when we have to make a decision. Are we going to uh, succumb to the authorities, the, dare I say religious authorities, 
who say you must never go out on the streets and speak in that name, the name of Jesus. You must never go out on you know, public broadcasting media to speak the name of, of Jesus. And, and Peter and John said, look, we have to make a decision. Do we obey God or man? And of course, as I've even read that scripture, we're going to be scoffed in the last days. People are going to scoff at us. I, I, I don't scoff. I, I think there's a kind of, my humour is tinged with sadness that, uh, that the vast majority of the media, uh, the, what we call the mass media or the mainstream media or social media, uh, does not allow any space for the reading of the scriptures, any space for the warnings of, of, of the prophetic word. And programs like World in Focus, uh, like The Late Show, Behind the Headlines, Politics Today, they are just a drop in the ocean compared to the vast majority of secular programs that are out there ridiculing the name of Christ, ridiculing Christian traditions, and um, having a form of godliness, but denying the power that is therein. This is uh, now Brian writing. Thank you very much for everyone who's writing in. We've still got, we've still got probably about 10 minutes if you want to um, uh, correct anything that I've said. I will read out your emails. Good evening, Tim. Unfortunately, Sir Winston Churchill's statement that the UN must not become a cockpit for the Tower of Babel has come to fruition. By the way, Brian, in all my ramblings, that's what I meant to say. That's exactly how it's become. It's a, it's a kind of there, if you can imagine on planet Earth, if you can imagine some Star Wars type you know, graphic, on planet Earth you have the, the UN, uh, is it Flushing Meadows? What's that? What's the name of the street? It's on there in New York. You have this UN building sitting there like a cockpit on planet Earth, uh, trying to steer the whole future of humanity. It, it, it is arrogant if it isn't so, wasn't so ridiculous. Anyway, it has come to fruition, Brian writes. It's not surprising to me due to uh, Bush's take on Churchill's speech, as they are members of uh, an occultist association, namely 322. I haven't heard of that one, uh, Brian. Um, I tend to see things on face, face value. Uh, um, where folks are, are Freemasons, then you can put that into the equation as well. I've not heard of 322. I don't know offhand what their motto is, but Scotland's Masonic equivalent, I suppose, would be the 33rd high degree, whose logo is Ordo Ab Chaos, or Order Out of Chaos. Very interesting, because that's a very biblical theme. In fact, that's the whole story of God's creation. It's creating order out of chaos. The earth was formless and void. God said, let there be light. And that can be the same in all of our lives, that when we are confused and, and we're in a spiritual fog, God can shine uh, thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I rose, the trumpets blazed with light, something like that. The dungeon blazed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth and followed thee. By the way, that does come from the story in the Acts with um, the Peter and John being imprisoned. Anyway, sorry, I'll keep reading what you've written. Uh, no wonder by now, by, by what we now see happening by their recent laws of silence, as Barry Smith pointed out, the occult symbols that are on the dollar's banking system, namely Novus Ordo uh, Seclorum, which means uh, order without God, is emulating the beast of revelation that will get rid of gold and silver or cash for buying and selling in the last days and Freemasonry. Although they will deny it, worship the devil as they have found their way into every important institution today. Yeah, Brian, you, you're picking up on, on genuine concerns in America when Roosevelt came in with the New Deal. And, you know, there are a number of commentators of the time in the 1930s who, who were very concerned about the direction of, of travel um, in, in America. And, of course, there are various streams, uh, you know, through American history 
but the, the stream that I would suggest is the most dangerous one at the moment, even though there are sort of isolationist tendencies and there are neocon tendencies that everyone's scared about, is the, is the progressive, liberal, you know, secular, you know, militant secularism, which I, I would suggest is most ominous. And as Joe Boot said in that excellent um, interview with Simon and Reagan on Behind the Headlines, um, um, he says it's terrifying. But I would probably quote Churchill and, again and say, these are not dark days, these are great days. And I do think that when there is darkness and when there is deceit you know, in the corridors of power, it's a great opportunity for us to say, the king has no clothes. This is you know, a paper tiger, it is, it is paper thin. The, these nonsense laws that are self-contradictory that say that you know you've got to not discriminate from one but you can discriminate from another exactly what joe boots saying look you can't say anything against this protected characteristic but you can trash um the christian faith which has gone uh, through and has woven through the fabric of our nation over a thousand years oh yeah you can trample on that one but you but this new trend, this new fad which has come in in the last couple of decades, that is sacred, it's sacrosanct, you can't say anything against it. That has to be called out and, and maybe even with some humour. Uh, and uh, Jean writes, I'm Scottish and I'm sorry but Scotland is in a very bad condition uh, for our Lord Jesus. Okay, have you said not to speak badly of them in leadership but if we stay silent and know the truth then aren't we just as bad, if not worse? Yeah, I, I, certainly we have to, you're, you're, I, I'm on the same page, Gene, but uh, you know, I always try and listen, you know, and not just, as it were, trample on uh, views that may, that may be correcting my misbehavior um, and you know, try and do better every time, if I can. I think we're, none of us should be beyond correction. Uh, good evening, Tim. Just as the statue of Oliver Cromwell still stands outside Westminster, bearing witness to the truth, with sword and Bible in hand, so John Knox still towers above the high hill of Glasgow's necropolis, with Bible and hand outstretched, witnessing to the gospel, maybe for not much longer, except the Lord preserve their silent witness. Yeah. The, the, these, these folk who, you know, not just Oliver Cromwell, but others who just said, no, we want to bring back, you know, the sanity of, of you know, the true profession of the gospel. And we want the king to speak uh, against this, uh, speak in favour of God's word and to be the defender of the faith. Uh, I, I had a call a few years ago by a QC who would now be a KC, um, a Queen's Council, King's Council. Um, he phoned me, I won't mention his name, quite senior, and he said, Tim, I can see the trend that is um, happening in uh, the legal, uh, the judiciary, in the legal world that is moving towards the gospel being designated as hate speech. And I just thought, wow, this is some, it's not Tim Vint speaking, it's a very senior barrister warning that that's the way we're headed as a nation. Well, it's not over yet. And, you know, those statues are still standing. But, you know, I think we've just got to, while it's day, let's speak the truth because a night is coming. No doubt. Watchman, what of the night in Isaiah? Watchman, what of the night is the call? And the watchman says, the morning comes, but also the night. And we have to be realistic that uh, the path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, shining ever brighter till the break of day. But the way of the wicked is deep darkness. And we have still a lot of wickedness in this world and in some quarters and corners increasing wickedness uh, but the light is still shining and the darkness 
as John wrote in the Gospel of John, cannot comprehend it or cannot overcome it or cannot understand it, that the light shines in the darkness. Praise the Lord. And uh, Michael, we've had quite a lot uh, from Scotland. Michael from Ireland um, writes, uh, England's demise, hard to watch, feared in soccer and rugby, now run of the mill. Did abortion rob them of many, prayer, many players and leaders? Ireland on top of the world with rugby. Abortion only in past few years. England needs to come back to the Lord. How did a Hindu and Muslim take over politics in the UK? Well, it is, uh, it's probably you know, positive discrimination and quotas, dare I say. And so it, it seems to be more palatable to have those who are not of my complexion and upbringing worldview uh, being in, in charge. Uh, and that just reflects multiculturalism. Histor historians can make a judgment on that. I don't know whether I've got time to read the final email from Barbara. One day, one day soon, we will be facing the opposition Peter and John uh, had when we declared Jesus is Lord. Have you seen the prayer given by Pastor Jack Hibbs at Congress? He mentioned God, Jesus and the Holy Spirit and has faced public censure for recognising Jesus as Lord in the face of a woke Congress. Congratulations to him. Are we prepared to be as brave and take the resulting censorship? I want to be an advocate for Jesus. Thank you so much, everyone who's written. Thank you, Barbara, for that great closing email. And stay tuned, and we'll see you next time on The Late Show.